This lecture is going to cover nuclear power and how we harvest energy from nuclear reactions. As of 2015, nuclear power made up just 4% of the global energy production, but it's still very important to understand. You can see that at that point, it was still double the share of renewables, and it has a lot of very interesting properties and could still be used quite a bit in the future. We have to get through some definitions first. First of all, you have to know what fission and fusion are and the difference between them. Fission of atoms means heavier nuclei of atoms splitting into lighter nuclei, whereas fusion is lighter nuclei combining into heavier nuclei. And while both can be used to generate energy, today's nuclear power plants only use fission. We do not have the technology to harvest large amounts of energy from fusion yet, but if we're able to figure that out, it's going to be probably one of the biggest events in human history because it will unleash just so much new usable energy. When an atom fissions, when it splits into smaller parts, some of its mass is actually also lost as energy. Mass is actually changed into energy. This is actually a violation of the conservation of mass and the conservation of energy because mass is being destroyed and energy is being created. So by the time you get into more advanced physics, we don't really talk about the conservation of mass and the conservation of energy. We talk about the conservation of mass energy. These two things are really fundamentally the same thing on a basic level. And the amount of energy that can be converted from a given mass is given by E equals mc squared, probably the most famous physics equation in the world, um, where c is equal to the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So E equals mc squared is actually a remarkably simple equation to use. It just says that if you convert mass into energy, this is exactly how much energy you're going to get out of this much mass. And it's a really gigantic amount of energy because the speed of light is so gigantic and we're squaring this. So just to show you how large it is, the first ever atomic tests, the Trinity tests of the first atomic bombs, when they created the atomic explosion, the mass that was converted into the energy of that explosion was about a third of a dime, 0. 0.0007 kilograms. So just that amount of mass contained enough energy to create the explosion that you can see in the animation, and the bomb had an area of impact equal to the area shown on the map that it placed to the left. We can compare this to the largest nuclear bomb ever created, and even that largest ever bomb, which you can see if it were dropped here, would consume everything from Baltimore to Fredericksburg was actually created from a mass of just 2.3 kilograms. You can do the math and see that using E equals mc squared, 2.3 kilograms times the speed of light squared gets you 2.1 times 10 to the 17th joules, which is a really stunning amount of energy. So because so much energy exists inside of mass and inside of atomic reactions, if we can harness that energy in any way, we have a huge and abundant amount of energy available to us. There are two types of fission reactions that normally take place in a nuclear reactor. Both involve uranium-235 being hit with a neutron. So you can see these are the two. And the main takeaway that I want you to get from these two reactions is that when we hit a uranium-235 atom with a neutron, it splits up into two smaller atoms plus some additional neutrons. And the energy that's created from the conversion of mass into energy actually exists in the kinetic energy of the neutrons. So that's where that energy is going into after the collision when some of the mass is lost. It changes into the kinetic energy of the the neutrons. And in both situations, when the neutrons hit the uranium-235, the atom is momentarily uranium-236, because you add a neutron, you add a nucleon, so it now has one more nucleon. But this type of uranium is extremely unstable and quickly splits, and the energy that is released from this reaction exists as kinetic energy in the particles, particularly the neutrons. So basically this reaction puts that E equals mc squared energy into the neutrons, which makes them go very fast. These are some important words that you'll need to understand. If we can get enough uranium-235 in one place, we can get what's called a chain reaction, where the neutrons from the first fission go on to hit other uranium-235 atoms, causing more reactions. So those create more neutrons, which hit more uranium-235, and it keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. We call this chain reaction self-sustaining, which means it can keep itself going without humans adding more neutrons. And we say that a chain reaction requires a critical mass of U-235 in order to happen. That is, enough U-235 atoms present so that the neutrons are likely to hit them. If we don't have enough U-235, we would say that we don't have a critical mass. What that means is that when we bombard the U-235 atom in the left box with the neutron, it splits up, but the neutrons go in random directions. And if we don't have too much other U-235, it's not very likely that the other neutrons will hit the other U-235. But if we have enough uranium-235, like when we have critical mass in the right box, and we hit that first atom with a neutron, the neutrons are still going to go in random directions, but because there are more uranium-235 atoms, that's going to mean that more will get hit by neutrons and create more neutrons and so on and so on. So we need a critical mass of uranium-235 to be able to make that happen. And most uranium exists as uranium-238, which we can't use in fission reactions. The average mass of uranium only contains 0.7% of uranium-235 and the rest is 238, and this is below the critical mass needed to create a large fission reaction. And to get the uranium to a critical mass of U-235, it needs to be enriched, which is a complex process 
process people use to increase the amount of U-235. So in this unit, you're going to see a few questions about what it means to enrich uranium. That just means getting more uranium-235 and getting less 238 within the concentration of uranium. Enriched uranium usually has about 3% of U-235 and 97% 238, and that seems like a very small difference from 0.7%, but it's enough to get a critical mass. So I've left two pictures of 100 nuclei each, and you can see that the difference between the non-enriched uranium that only has one U-235 and the enriched uranium that has three seems to be very small, but that difference is enough to allow us to get an atomic reaction as opposed to not getting a reaction. These are parts of a nuclear power plant. I'm going to start with what happens inside of the reactor of the power plant. You can see that we keep the fuel rods of the enriched uranium inside of the center of the reactor where the fission reactions happen. Control rods are raised and lowered between the fuel rods, and these control rods absorb the neutrons that are bouncing around to stop fission from happening. So if we want to shut down the reaction so that it doesn't get too hot and there's no meltdown, we need to have control rods that can be lowered in to absorb the neutrons in the reaction. Control rods are always made of material that can't themselves be very easily fissioned by being bombarded with neutrons. So usually they just absorb the neutrons. A moderator is a substance that slows the velocity of the neutrons that are released from the reactions. This is a little confusing to students because the moderator sounds like it would prevent more energy from being released, but the opposite is actually true. By slowing down neutrons, moderators actually make more fission reactions more likely because if the neutrons are moving too fast through an atom, they actually can't fuse to it to make uranium-236 and fission cannot happen. So we need a moderator to allow for more nuclear reactions rather than less. Moderators are usually made of graphite or water. We often say that moderators remove kinetic energy from neutrons, and if you remove the moderator, there is less of a chance of fission happening, so there is less of a power output from the nuclear power station. Finally, the coolant in the station is usually water or liquid sodium. This passes through the moderator and gets hit by the neutrons, and the kinetic energy of the neutrons is captured as thermal energy in the coolant to be used to make electricity later. So the coolant kind of captures all the heat that's being created by these reactions and takes it somewhere else. The steps of energy conversion in a nuclear power plant look like this. In step number one, nuclear energy in uranium is converted to kinetic energy of neutrons. In step number two, the kinetic energy of neutrons is converted to thermal energy and coolant. Both of those things happen inside of the reactor. And then in step number three, thermal energy and coolant is converted to the kinetic energy of steam. So this just means that the water in the coolant is being heated up so much by those reactions that it's converted into steam which like most other power plants, because the steam now has kinetic energy, that kinetic energy can be used to spin a turbine, which is used by a generator to spin a magnet around a coil, which creates electricity. So even though nuclear power involves incredibly complicated physics, it's still ultimately just spinning a turbine to make a generator turn. You can also see some other interesting details, like after the steam is used to turn the turbine, it's condensed back into water in the condenser, and then some of the steam is released by the cooling towers of the nuclear power plant. So if you've ever seen pictures of an operational nuclear power plant and you've seen stuff coming out of the cooling towers, that's actually all just completely harmless steam. It's not CO2 or other greenhouse gases. Even though water is technically a greenhouse gas, steam behaves very differently in the atmosphere. So this is actually just harmless steam coming out of the nuclear power plant. These are the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear power. One main advantage is nuclear power does not emit carbon. Nuclear power itself does not contribute to climate change, although transporting and mining the uranium does. And we have large reserves of nuclear fuels, so we're not going to run out anytime soon. And we can control when the nuclear reactions happen, and it generates a lot of relatively cheap electricity. The disadvantages is that it's non-renewable, so we will eventually run out, although in a very long time. Nuclear power plants also create nuclear waste, which is difficult to store safely. We do have the technology to store it safely, though. And nuclear power can potentially be extremely dangerous. If there's a core meltdown at a nuclear power plant, many people could die because radiation would be unleashed from the plant. So this is definitely a danger and a concern, but nuclear power plants as they exist today are designed with many, many, many different protections in place to prevent this from happening. We're going to move into talking about nuclear fusion, which is a more advanced kind of futuristic type of power that we don't have access to right now. And this only occurs in plasma, which is an incredibly hot state of matter. And right now, plasma only occurs consistently in extreme circumstances of incredibly high energy. So examples of where that occurs is the center of the sun or hydrogen bombs. And these circumstances are too extreme to allow us to use fusion power right now. These are some problems you can see with creating plasma to create nuclear fusion power. You can copy those down. I'm not going to list all of them, but you will definitely need to know those problems for this unit. 
If nuclear fusion worked, it could actually create energy from one of the waste products of fission, which is plutonium-239. So we could actually take some of the nuclear waste from a fission reactor, and instead of having to bury it, just use it to create more nuclear power. This would be extremely useful, as we would have a way of recycling the waste from nuclear fission into even more energy. And we could use many other materials as fuels, have much less nuclear waste, and would effectively have nearly unlimited free, clean energy. So that would be kind of the dream, and a lot of scientists are working really hard right now to see if nuclear fusion is possible, but they've been working at that for a really long time, and at least in the next few years, I don't think it's very likely that there will be breakthroughs, but we will see what happens. Most nuclear power math involves multiple steps of the factor label method. You'll have to refer to what you know about the relationship between atoms, mass, energy, and time. So we can move into the example problem. A nuclear reactor needs to generate 500 megawatts for eight hours every day. If each fission of U-235 produces 3.2 times 10 to the negative 11th joules of energy, how much U-235 will be required to keep the plant running for 30 days if the plant is 32% efficient? So I'm going to start with what I know. It's 500 megawatts of power, and that needs to happen for eight hours every day. And 500 megawatts is equal to 500 megajoules per second, which is equal to 500 times 10 to the 6th joules per second, which is equal to 5 times 10 to the 8th joules per second, if I'm writing this in scientific notation. So we want this to run for 30 days, and I know that it's running for 8 hours every day, so I'm going to convert that into the total number of hours that we're going to need to run it. And because my power is in seconds, I need to convert from hours into seconds, canceling this out. The full amount of time we need to get power here is going to be 864,000 seconds. So the total energy out that we need to get out of this power plant is going to be that 5 times 10 to the 8th joules times the number of seconds, because this is how much it's producing every second. So multiplying that by the number of seconds that it will run gets us how much it will produce altogether. That's equal to 4.32 times 10 to the 14th joules. That's how much energy we need to get out of this altogether. 32% efficient means that the energy out is equal to 0.32 times the energy in, and we need the energy in because we need to know how much uranium we need to put into the system. So calculating this out, I find that the energy in is 1.35 times 10 to the 15th joules. That's how much energy is going in from the uranium. So now that I know that, I just need to figure out how many fissions I need to do. So I need to convert from joules to the number of atoms. And this is saying that each fission of U-235, each individual atom is going to produce 3.2 times 10 to the negative 11th joules. So for every one atom, this is how many joules there are. And now I need to convert from atoms into mass because I need to know how much mass of U-235 I need. So I'm going from atoms in the denominator to moles in my numerator. And I know by Avogadro's number that for every one mole, this is how many atoms there are in the substance. And now I need to go from moles to mass. So I'm gonna go from moles to grams. And I know based on the definition of molar mass that for every one mole of uranium-235, by definition, there are 235 grams of mass. And finally, I'd like to go from grams to kilograms just to get this in a more normal amount of mass. So I know that for every one kilogram, there are 1,000 grams. Canceling all of this out tells me that if I need 1.35 times 10 to the 15th joules of energy from uranium-235, I'm going to need 16.5 kilograms of uranium-235. That is an incredibly small mass to generate that much power for a month for eight days every day, but that's how much energy is contained within the incredibly small mass that we're putting into the nuclear power plant. Most of the math for nuclear power stations is going to look a lot like that. Just remember that you will need to understand Avogadro's number and how to convert from a mole to grams for a substance.